and related to your target group that you work with. So, <clears throat> excuse me. As Deb said, I am um, an Ohio ambassador for charting the life course. And this session is provided through a grant from the department. Uh, and I am working with the Nysonger Center. I live in a condo association and the landscaper is cutting grass. So if my audio becomes too difficult to hear, please let me know and I will put a headset on. Uh, a little bit about me though, I worked in the D, I've worked in the D, IDD field for over 45 years. I retired from the Cuyahoga County Board and I worked from uh, in a variety of roles, including a di direct support professional, speech language pathologist, an SSA, service and support administrator, uh, staff development, a trainer, and other roles. So if you could continue to type what your role is and what you are doing. Oh, Emily's in my area, Case Western Reserve. I am, I live in the Cleveland area. And um, so I am so glad that you've joined us for lunch uh, for all of you. Do whatever you need to do to be comfortable. If you have any questions at all, please type them in chat um, and uh, I will look at them or Jamie or um, Deb will uh, cue me that there's a question. So we're going to do this in two parts. <clears throat> I want to go over the principles of charting the life course and talk about the life domains. We'll talk about how to use some of the tools with students and their families and adults. It doesn't matter what age. And we'll also talk about the concept of anticipatory guidance. So a, a, a brief overview of charting the life course. Charting the life course is the only person-centered approach I know of that was developed by and for people with disabilities and their families. All the other approaches were developed by professionals. This is what you need to do. This is how you do it. <clears throat> and the reason I highlight this is because <clears throat> I've been sharing information about charting the life course for um, almost seven years with uh, families and with people living with disabilities. And what families and, and people with lived experience tell me is that this is easy. It makes sense. Um, I understand it. And it helps me get my thoughts together. It may not be easy to sit down and think of everything, but the tools are easy to use. <clears throat> I've also worked with hundreds of people with disabilities and they have said it really helps them be in charge, think about what's important to them um, and share it with the people who support them, both paid and unpaid. Ohio is part of a national community of practice, which means we share what we're learning with people in at least 26 states, uh, but we also get to learn from them. So this is not just what's happening in Ohio, this is what's happening all across the country. <clears throat> what we wanna see in Ohio is we wanna see that people with disabilities, families, and professionals know about charting the life course. They use it um, to gather information, organize information about what a good life is. And then professionals take that information and help people identify supports and actions to move towards the life they value. What we don't want is that people look at charting the life course as another form or, oh, they're pretty, they're colorful. Oh gosh, here's another piece of paper I have to complete. Um, that re people really use the tools to support and empower people and families. So what we're doing in Ohio is we're sharing information with anybody, professionals, families, uh, people with lived experience, professionals across service systems. So 
In the United States, we know that charting the life course is used in early intervention. It's used with school age, with transition, with juvenile justice, adult justice, intellectual and developmental disabilities, mental health, um, school, just plain school, school, kids that don't have labels. Um, what else? Oh, medical, in the medical arena, and also in the aging arena. So really charting the life course can be used across the lifespan. And we want all professionals to know. So I'm very excited that I see that there's an SSA on the call. So you work in IDD, Emily, you're looking at, um, you work in mental health, Julie, you work in IDD, and anyone else who wants to tell me what they do in the age group that they work with, um, I'd appreciate it. In Ohio, we have a community of practice. Please sign up. We want to share information with you. Um, and we also want to hear from you what you're doing with charting the life course. So the core concept of charting the life course is that everyone, everyone, it doesn't say people with disabilities, everyone, all people and their families have the right to live, love, work, play, learn and pursue their life aspirations in the community. We want everyone to have a good life. So for people who are receiving supports through whatever system they're involved in, we want them to have that civil right of self-determination. And that doesn't mean making choices. It means having control over decisions affecting your life. That's different than making choices. Um, on this call, I made a choice to drink water, not coffee. Um, that's just a choice. I, I decided between a couple of options. But what we're talking about is control over decisions affecting your life. We want everybody, people to have interdependence. We do not believe that anyone is independent. None of us is independent. I don't cut my own grass. I don't fix my car. I don't grow my food. I don't make my clothes. Um, none of us is independent. And yet when we talk to people with lived experience who have disabilities, we always talk about them being independent, but none of us are. So why do we set that bar? I will tell you that I've had families, um, share, I've shared this with families and one mother on the second session I did with her group said to me, you know, Barb, you talked about interdependence and not independent. And my husband and I want our son to be independent. But what you said really spoke to us. And after the call, after the Zoom, I talked to my husband and the next day we talked to our son who is 17 and refuses to talk to his parents about what he wants to do, refuses to talk in his IEP meeting, refuses to tell his teacher what he wants to do. And she said, I told him, you know, we've been mistaken. No one is independent. You don't have to worry about being independent. We are all interdependent. And she said, his face relaxed. And all of a sudden he goes, I was scared. I would never be able to do all those things that people told me I had to do to be independent. And he started talking to his parents about what he wanted to do, what he you know, hoped to achieve in his life, his dreams. She goes, we never had that conversation before. And I said, isn't it terrible that we have imposed this burden on people by using the word independent? Other families have told, well, I want my son or daughter to be independent when they're, you know, when they get out of school. And I said, what does independent look like? And they said, you know, and I said, I don't. <laughs> and one mom said, you know, we have a bedroom and a bathroom in our basement. And our three older children have kind of boomeranged back and stayed in that bedroom after college, before they got a job, when they lost a job, before they found another one. Um, for various reasons. And she goes, I don't want my daughter to live in that, in our basement. I said, that's the vision. You don't want your daughter to live in the basement. Another father last week, I think his child is only seven or eight. He said, I want my son to be, live independently. And I said, you know, what does that mean? 
And his response was, I want him to live as independently as possible with the supports he needs. And I thought, that's, that's the vision. That's the vision. Live as independent as possible with the supports you need. I'm not going to ask how many of you went to college and didn't do your own laundry and ate ramen noodles and uh, all that other good stuff. None of you had to prove a level of independence before you could move out. Okay, so let's not impose that on people, but we want families to be supported so their resilience and their strengths are recognized and supported um, and enhanced so they can take care, love, and support the people in their family. In person-centered thinking, and I always reference person-centered thinking, because regardless of what service system you work in, regardless of where people get supports, we all have to be person-centered. That's in Medicaid and Medicare guidelines. <laughs> but what we want to see in person-centered thinking is that people have positive control over their life that they want, that they're recognized as being contributing members of their community, and that they have supports that are both paid and not paid. In other words, we want people to get better lives, not just better paper. <clears throat> so let me talk about charting the life course a little bit more. It's really about having different conversations, uh, a different way of thinking. We encourage high expectations. So if somebody tells us they wanna be a pilot or a manager, or a doctor or a veterinarian, we don't say, oh, no, 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 you can't, sorry. But we have deeper conversations. What is it that they really want? What does that mean? How can we provide them with experiences and opportunities? My niece, when she was little, told me she wanted to be an astronaut. So what did I do? I took her to the Science Museum in Cleveland. I got her a kid's telescope so she could look at the stars. Uh, I took her to the library to get books on stories about astronauts and space and planets. Let me tell you, she did not become an astronaut. She has a PhD in psychology. So, but because she expressed an interest, I didn't say, no, I'm sorry, you can't. No women are astronauts. I said, let's pursue, let's learn more. And that's what we want to do. We want to help people have experiences and opportunities. Charting the life course is not about tools and it's not a program. So I hope I never hear anybody say, we do charting the life course. It's a set of resources you can use, you can pull out when you need them. And it's for anyone, regardless of age or ability. And as with any person-centered approach, we gather information from the person, from their words and their actions. I'm a speech language pathologist. I have yet to meet anyone in my 45 years of lived and professional experience um, that don't, that people can't tell me what they, what that person likes and doesn't like, wants and doesn't want. So we have eight guiding principles in charting the life course. It's for everyone. I already said that. I've seen it used with babies, families using it with babies. I've seen it used um, by adults with their 95 year old mother who has dementia and can no longer tell them what she wants. We look at the importance of family systems and cycles and that everybody exists in a family. And if something happens to one person in the family, it affects everybody. It's used across the life stages from prenatal to aging and the importance of having a trajectory or a vision of a good life. We recognize the importance of having outcomes and experiences. How do we know what we want or don't want if we've never tried something? We talk about life domains, not skills. And I'll talk more about that tomorrow. We talk about three buckets of support and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. And that we all get support in five areas. <clears throat> and the importance of having people with disabilities and families at the table to make decisions about policy and systems. Not to hear after, like, do you agree with this, but to actually be there when it's being discussed and decided. 
So I would be remiss if I didn't have a slide about siblings. For those of you that work with children, I hope that you recognize the importance of siblings. We are typically our, the, our brothers or sisters first playmate, first friend, first coach, first confidant. And also with the exception of our parents, we're probably their first teachers. So if any of you have brothers and sisters and you are the older one, just think about when you get that younger brother or sister, how quickly you took out a book and said to your brother or sister who might've been months old, this is a dog, say dog, a dog goes woof woof. <laughs> you were the teacher automatically. And we know that siblings play multiple roles of support and caregiving. We recognize that everyone exists within the context of a family and family is defined by the person, could be biological or chosen, and that it's not dependent on where they live or if they come to meetings. So a lot of times professionals will say, well, the family is not engaged or they're not active because they don't show up at meetings. But uh, professionals, I hate to tell you, lots of families don't like our meetings. They want to know why we have such long meetings and go over information that you've already got and have heard. And just a, um, my own personal pet peeve, why do meetings take so long? And please remember that when we talk about trauma-informed care, every time we ask somebody what their disability is or we label it or we ask the family, we need to be mindful that we may be putting that person through trauma again of when they heard that diagnosis. Um, in person-centered thinking, we believe and acknowledge that every person with a disability and every family has experienced trauma as a result of that disability. So families have told us they need three buckets of support. <clears throat> Um, in the blue bucket is discovery and navigation. We need information. How do I get through my day? What does this mean? Uh, the mustard colored bucket is goods and services, not just in the service system, but where are the good doctors? Who's a good dentist? What does my community get, uh, offer? What are the recreation uh, opportunities out there in my community? and connecting and networking with someone else who's had similar experiences. None of us have the same experiences, but similar. So I um, put on the bottom of the screen, uh, the link, uh, you can go to DODD, the Department of Developmental Disabilities. There's a tab that says families and families can scroll, scroll down and there's ways to connect with other families in Ohio virtually. As a sibling, I belong to the Sibling Leadership Network and to SibNet, which is a closed Facebook page for adults who have brothers and sisters with any disability, mental health, IDD, medical, um, it doesn't matter. And there's about 5,000 adult siblings on that closed Facebook page. I sent you, or in the handouts, you will get this charting the life course portfolio. And I'm gonna go over just one of the three tools today. And I want you to think about the words that we use. Whenever I ask siblings to talk about their brother or sister, they use the same sentence. I have a brother or sister who is X years old and has A, B, C, D, E disabilities. They live with my parents and they go to this day program. And I tell them, that's very nice. You just told me what made them eligible for services. Now tell me who they are. We have taught families to talk about their loved ones in the, the frame of the disability. So think about the words we use. They convey our values. Do we talk about people's deficits or their qualities? Do we talk about them being needy or contributing? Do we talk about them being independent or their lack of independence? Or do we talk about their interdependence? And when we talk about them, do we talk about their needs or their support? So I think I quickly went over my uh, 
Oh, I didn't include um, the, the picture of my brother. Oops. Uh, but I am a sibling. I had two younger brothers. One, Nick had a developmental disability. Jim had an acquired disability as a result of an accident. If I used professional jargon, I would say that Nick needed total care. But those are his needs. Let's talk about, instead of needs, supports. So we... What helps us do this is the one page person center description. And we wanna stop talking about disabilities and start talking about the human being. So there's three sections on the one page person center description. Uh, what people like and admire about me, what's important to me and how to best support me. I tell people don't use this template, use a Word doc and use text boxes and put a photo on it because when people see a photograph, they see a human being. So let me talk about like and admire. We always start by asking, what do you like and admire about the person? Or we ask the person, what do people say they like about you? Or what are you proud of? And we wanna identify qualities, not what people do. So a lot of times people will say, oh, she's a good swimmer. Okay, that's what she does. But who is she? Is she athletic? Or she, uh, he participates in Special Olympics. Well, great, that's the activity, that's what they do, but who are they? Are they competitive? Are they athletic? Or are they just social? They like Special Olympics because they get to see lots of people and talk to them. When I ask people with disabilities, what do you like and admire about yourself? Or what do people like and admire about you? Usually I hear only one word and that is, I'm nice. And I think how sad that that's the only word that they can self-identify. Uh, the first time I did a person-centered plan was 1997. I worked with a man who was 55 years old, lived with his older sister. Uh, she needed to feed him, dress him, bathe him, change him, everything. And um, when I asked him, who do you want to be part of the conversation? His, his sister said, nobody, it's our business. We don't wanna talk about our business in front of anybody. I said, fine. And she said, but I'll call you. So she called me a couple of days later and she said, we'd like, Thomas wants his two pastors to be part of the conversation. And I just went, oh my gosh, not one pastor, two? And I thought, oh, I'm going to be facilitating a person-centered meeting with two pastors. And I asked them, could you tell me how long you've known Thomas um, and what you like and admire about him? And the first gentleman said, I think I've known Thomas my whole life. Um, I grew up near the family and his mother used to make chocolate chip cookies. And so after school, she, the door was always open for kids to come in. What a smart mother. Thomas had been excluded from school. What a smart mother. She got the kids in the neighborhood to come over because she made chocolate chip cookies. Not every day. He goes, but I've known Thomas my whole life. He goes, and Thomas is a man of God. And I just went, whoa. And I wrote down on his plan, man of God, and put it in quotes. I asked the other pastor, how long have you known Thomas? He goes, well, I've been Thomas's pastor for 25 years. Uh, the church paid for him to go to camp. We've, you know, helped him throughout the years. Um, and I would say that Thomas is joyful and sings praises to God. I need to tell you, Thomas's speech was unintelligible. And I say that as a speech language pathologist and a sibling. <laughs> I wrote that down. Thomas passed away about three or four years ago and I went to the funeral and um, because I maintained a relationship with Thomas and his sister after I had a paid relationship. And his current SSA came up to me and he goes, you know, every year I ask him, Thomas, on your ISP, it says you're a man of God and you're joyful, you sing praises to God. Do you want to change that? And Thomas would go, no. <laughs> he goes, it's been on his plan, Barb, for 20 years. That's what we're looking for. 
I Googled, Dr. Google has given me a list of qualities to share with you. So if people can't identify, help them identify what their qualities are. The second section is what's important to me. So who are the people uh, that are important? Not just friends and family, but who? Who, what specific people are important to them? What are the important rituals and routines? Do they have to watch a certain TV show? Do they come home and do something right away? Um, do they uh, have a rhythm and pace? Do they get up and go? The running joke with Deb is we're both early risers, um, but I'm guessing that Deb dresses earlier than I do, whereas I may still be in my jammies. And sometimes Deb will, Deb will say, here's the Zoom link for our eight o'clock meeting. And I'll be like, um, um, could we just do a phone call so I don't have to get dressed? <laughs> so, you know, our rhythm and pace is a little different. Uh, status and control. People with disabilities tell me status and control, having a key to their house having technology, a smartphone, uh, purpose and meaning and culture and identity. Not, and please, please, please don't put going to Walmart, um, going out to eat at McDonald's or the buffet and bowling. Cause all three of those are things to do and places to go. We need to find out more about what's important to people. What's important to people are those things they need to have in their life. <clears throat> None of you would say, gosh, I have a good life because I go to Walmart. Uh, but what is it? Who are the people that are special to you? How to best support me? This is instead of writing needs, we all need help. We're interdependent. So what is it that you can do to help me? Uh, so one woman, um, I think one of you is an employment specialist or something. She wrote for her boss. When you teach me something new, show me, tell me, show me, and then watch me right away and tell me how I did it. She doesn't need a job coach. She just identified her own accommodations. That's what someone else needs to do. And that's what how to best support me is. What someone else needs to do. One mother of a seven-year-old said, remind me to wear headphones in a noisy place. You can guess his diagnosis, but if you tell people he's on the spectrum, they won't know what to do. But if you say, remind me to wear headphones, anybody can do that. So here's my one page description as a trainer. Uh, what people like and admire about me is I'm encouraging, again, if you have any questions, type them in chat. <laughs> um, I'm knowledgeable, I'm passionate, I'm prepared. Uh, what's important to me as I'm training is be engaged, feel comfortable to ask questions, and that I'm prepared and punctual. And how to support me, ask questions, be courteous, ask for clarification, give me feedback, and challenge me. So I want you to think about your own one page person centered description in your work life. And we have, I wanna see how many people, we have four people, that's it. Okay, we have four people other than one, two, three, four. Okay, we have four people. So I don't think we're gonna do breakouts, um, but what I want you to do is think about in your work life, Write these down because you're going to be sharing them out loud. <laughs> what do your coworkers like and admire about you? In my work life, people admired that I was organized and I had a historical perspective because I had worked there so long that I had this perspective of, of uh, uh, what people, what was happening, what happened. I was knowledgeable. What's important to you at work? For me, what was important to me was to have a little bit of time in the morning to organize my day. What was important to me was to be have challenging opportunities. I didn't like to be bored. I didn't like to do the same thing over and over. Um, and I like to be given um, challenging uh, projects. And what others could do to support me, um, 
ask me if it's a good time before you start talking to me. Uh, always be on time or let me know if you're gonna be late and don't micromanage me. Give me a task, let me do it and know that I'll ask you if I have a question. So I would like to ask at least one or two of you to unmute and tell us who you are in two to three sentences, that's all. What others like and admire about you, what's important to you at work and what others can help you do to support you to help you have a good day. Do I have a taker? Somebody volunteer. Let's see, we have Hello. Hillary, Julie, Blake or Scott. Well, I'm Julie. Just wanted to let you know, how are you? You've done a great presentation so far. I'm very impressed and I love the thought process behind this. Great. Um, but I would just like to say that uh, as an employment navigator, I feel that my coworkers would like and admire that if they send an email or a question or call whatever to, um, to our department for any support that I am very quick to respond. Um, I am very thorough often sometimes too thorough where I'll, I'll often be at that teaching capacity. Um, do you understand or does that make sense? Often trying to allow that person the opportunity to explain that there's something that doesn't make sense. Uh, and one more area would be that I try not to, I feel that people would say I try not to um, make anyone feel uncomfortable if they have questions uh, that maybe seem, I wanna say, um, not dumb, but you know, just that, that, that there is no dumb question per se. Does absolutely. that make sense, Barbara? There you yes, go. I do absolutely. it every time. Okay. <laughs> um, what's important to me is that I just really feel that uh, it's important to do unto others as you wish others would do unto you. I think the golden rule should live above and beyond. I think we would be so much better as a, a nation, as a world, <laughs> if we had that to live by. Um, so I really do think that that's important to me as I would be treating others that, that, that the way I want them to treat myself. Um, and then I would say that that arching theme would, would, would carry over to that third um, question, which is what others can do to support me. Uh, I have excellent support from my agency. Um, just giving me the training that I would need to be the best that I can be would be another area that I think would be very helpful to support me. Awesome. Awesome. I'm so glad you said that. Of course. Give me the training or the information to do my job. Awesome. Thank you so right. much. This has been a wonderful one. So I, I am completely and thoroughly engrossed. I, I appreciate your time and all your efforts to uh, put, put this out here. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we're trying to do it in two one hour segments, but please know that we do offer longer and we could do it with any group, any group that's interested. I'm more than happy to do a presentation. Um, let me keep going because I want to be mindful of our time. If I have time, I may loop back and ask somebody else. So I'm not going to do that. But let me show you my brother Nick's <clears throat> one page person center description. First of all, you notice it doesn't say Nick Seferis, it says Nick the Greek because that's the way he liked to be called. Please note that there are some quotation marks. That means he said them. I don't like when we typically use the pronoun I or my, and it really isn't about or by the person. Um, so only use quotes or the pronoun I if the person said it. But look at the great things about him. He's ornery. Uh, my 96-year-old mother still says Nick was ornery. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But those are his qualities. You notice there's no activities. It's all qualities. Important too, I tried to capture relationships, chatting with me every night, things to do, go to family events, status and control, having privacy having time alone, culture and identity, our Greek culture and traditions and religion, um, things to have, his music. Now, please don't list that someone likes music because I'll start playing my Greek music and I'm sure that'll make people cringe. Be specific, that's why I said listening to my music, uh, getting his hair styled and going to the bar and having a 7-7 while he watched the Indians games. Under how to best support, 
Instead of writing, Nick was totally dependent on activities of daily living. That would be the jargon. <laughs> Um, I wrote how to best support him. Use a spoon to feed me. Put the food on my left side between my teeth. Uh, don't read over my shoulder and listen to my conversations. I can hear and understand you. Don't yell or use a parrot voice. I'm old enough to be your father. Put me on my stomach with a pillow between my knees. Don't give me fruit or juice. And I'm most comfortable in my chair, in my wheelchair. Please notice I put a photograph uh, Nick is sitting in a convertible. It is not my convertible. It was a friend's. Uh, we grew up in Northeast Ohio outside of Cleveland. And I, my joke is that you can drive a convertible about five days a year up here because it's so, we have such bizarre weather. But anyway, um, so you notice it has nothing to do with demographics. There's no age, there's no address, there's no guardianship status, there's no diagnosis. Why? Because we want to talk about who this human being is. So some things to remember, use a word doc like I did for Nick. People and do it with the person. This is not something we do for people. We do it with the person. Please also, it's better if you have a reason why you're doing it. So um, uh, Employment Navigator. A lot of people like to develop a one-page person-centered description as part of their um, resume. And several people have put photographs of themselves on their resume doing activities related to the job they want. So one young man I know um, put a photograph of him watering his mother's garden because he wants to work in landscaping. Um, Sometimes people put what they like. So maybe they'll put a mascot from a team or the Avengers or Star Trek, Star Wars. Um, what else is out there and big? Anything that's meaningful for kids. I've often seen parents put things like Barney and Thomas the Tank, because if anybody sees it, they immediately know how to start a conversation with this child. Oh, you like Barney, I like Barney too, or I like Elmo or whatever. Um, I tell families or, or anybody have multiple copies, keep one in a plastic sheet protector and put it somewhere where anybody can see it. Uh, lots of families will put it on the refrigerator. Some people getting supports will uh, have told me they put it in a frame and when staff come in their home, they'll ask, they'll tell them, go read it before you work with me. This past year, we've seen the importance of having a one-page description for hospitalization and families have really, um, really been drawn to this. Making it, whether or not their person typically is hospitalized, but some families with some medically fragile family members have done it because just in case it, they're ready. So keep it simple. We know that people working in hospitals are overworked, they're tired, but they also wanna make sure their patients are comfortable and um, they wanna reduce anxiety. Um, I tell people again, put it in a plastic sheet protector, put it above the bed. So anybody walking in that room, whether they're drawing blood, taking stats, uh, doing rounds, delivering a meal, they see it immediately. And I tell families, even if you know you can go in the hospital, do, uh, do one and post it because there are, I've kept bedside vigils for family members. And I know that you leave to go to the bathroom and that's the time that someone comes in that you wanted to see and talk to. So, and you weren't there to give them some information. So like and admire is gonna be the same, but important too, what's important to them in the hospital to have their cell phone to make sure it's charged um i have two family members that are chaplains and they have said with covid they cannot go visit people unless there is a request so if that's important make sure that's listed uh you know does this child need to have something or adult that's comforting, a stuffed animal, a blanket, their iPad, a spiritual item, their Bible, a cross, whatever. Or 
do, do they need to have the TV on? My brother had a hard time manipulating the remote. So I would tell, just leave the TV on. <laughs> Let the TV on so he can watch it. Um, how to best support. Tell them how to use the call button, how to position them, how to recognize if they're anxious and what to do. I, I will tell you the first time I wrote one for my brother, Nick, I, gave, I thought I was so cool. I gave it to the nurse in charge. Oh, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh my God, this is so helpful. And she put it in the file and no one ever saw it. And so that's why I say, put it above the bed, post it above the bed. Um, how to give medication, um, who to contact and how they express pain. So let me show you NICs for hospitalizations. Unfortunately, we learned this over time. Um, again, chatting with my sister every day, talking decisions over with her, and here's my cell phone number. Uh, if Nick was hospitalized, I was there every day, not all day, um, and Nick did not have a guardian. I believed he could make his own decisions, so we used supported decision making, and as a speech pathologist, I was I pushed people, you just gave them what you want them to decide. I want you to give them all the information, not just what you want him to know. So I pushed for that, but how to best support me? I can answer, Nick used a laptop with voice output in the hospital, he couldn't access it. So ask me yes, no questions. I will not or move my um, uh, eyes. Uh, put me on my stomach. We are my eyebrows. Put me on my stomach in bed with a pillow between my knees. We learned the hard way they would put him on his back and he was in chronic pain all day long. Um, I can't feel pain on my right side. For any of you that have sat with someone in the hospital, you know everybody and their mother comes in. Hi, Nick, what's your pain level? Zero to 10. And he would say zero and I'd be like, whoa, that's only on his left side. He can't tell, he doesn't feel pain on his right side. Uh, put me in my wheelchair. That's where I'm the most comfortable. And you can give me my pills and ice cream. I love that one because that was Nick's dream. Don't give me applesauce. Give them to me an ice cream. So we know staff are busy. We know they want to provide the best care. This is a quick way to give them the information. The beauty of the one-page person-centered description First of all, you don't need to answer, but if you're brave, you can type it in the chat box. How long are your ISPs? I've had families tell me eight to 80 pages. Um, one mother told me three hours of my life I'll never get back. <laughs> I just love that one. And this is a mother whose daughter is in her, tw at the time she said it was in her 20s, 30s, 30s. The county board had known her for over 20 years. She lived with her parents, no behavior needs, no, uh, not a lot of homemaker personal care support at home, no behavior challenges. Um, and the ISP took three hours. And she was like, Barb, the county board has known her for 20 years. Why is the meeting three hours? They already know what she needs. Um, so the one page person said her description can be general. If you're working with children, I always tell people, uh, do one at the beginning of every school year and give it to all the teachers. Um, if people are going to respite or they're hiring staff, people have written them when they interview staff. Some people have written them for healthcare appointments. One mother wrote um, for her eight-year-old son, when we come to the desk and check in, immediately put us in an exam room. Don't tell him to take out his earbuds. Don't tell him it won't hurt. Don't talk behind his back. And if you're gonna give him a shot, rub his arm so he knows where you're going to give him the shot. You can guess his diagnosis, but the office staff said, oh my God, this made it so easy. We knew exactly what to do. If you told those office staff he was on the spectrum, they wouldn't know what to do. But this is very clear on one piece of paper, we're giving people a quick snapshot of what they can do to support the person and who this human being is. 
If any of you work with providers, day and residential providers have used it as the subfolder. They put uh, each one page person center description in a plastic sheet in the folder. Some one family, one father I know developed a one page person center description for his three year old son who had just been diagnosed on the spectrum, did it with his wife because they were going to a family reunion. And the family, you know, through the buzz, had heard their child had autism and they didn't want anyone to be afraid to talk to their child. So they wrote things, um, they put Barney and Thomas the Tank and somebody else, and I can't remember what it was, and said, you can come up to me and ask me about Barney, or you can, I love to play catch, you know, throw the ball with me or whatever. And so that the family wouldn't be hesitant to engage with him. And I thought, what? And then they emailed it to everybody that was coming to the reunion. What an awesome thing. Some people I know have used it to interview their roommates, their housemates, potential. And some staff have used it, developing their own and introducing themselves to their coworkers. So what we wanna see for the one page person center description is that it's human centric. There's nothing about disability in there. That it's who the person is, not what they do. And that it's about their qualities, what other people need to do so that they feel respected, comfortable. It has to be simple, one page, because anybody will read one page. Lots of people will not read eight to 80 pages. So one page. And it's developed for a purpose. If you're writing one for a healthcare appointment, it's going to be different than one that's written for a teacher, which is going to be different than one written for an, a potential employer, uh, which is different than one written for respite provider. Um, use a photo and it's developed by the person and family and those who know them the best. It's not demographic. Oh, some providers have also stapled it to the back of the emergency medical form. So that if someone is transported to a hospital, they not only get the demographics they need, the meds, the diagnosis, blah, 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 but also who that person is so that they can engage with them. And, um, help them feel more comfortable. It can be used as an introduction, as a summary. I've had, oh, you, oh yes, there's someone on the call that, that is going to work in mental health. I've had community counselors say on uh, trainings, oh my gosh, I'm gonna do one of these with everybody I work with because they all have such low self-esteem that if we start talking about what they like and admire, what they're proud of, what others like about them, how to support them, this will raise their self-esteem. And so I thought that was such an awesome, awesome. And this was a counselor that works with multi-system youth who are at risk. So I thought, what a great way. Um, for those of you working with transition students, the how to best support me is also a way to identify accommodations. And that's the whole purpose of the transition plan for students to start thinking about what do others need to do to help me so I can be successful? Or what do they need to do to support me? So I want you to think about how you can use a one page Ah, thank you, you guys, your comments are awesome. Um, <laughs> how you can use the one page person center description. First of all, let me summarize and I think I'm going to stop sharing my screen in a minute. So remember the concepts, the person in the context of their family. We'll talk about the six life domains tomorrow. The three buckets of support. How are we helping people and families? They need information about how to get through their days. They need information about goods and services, and they need to connect with other people who have similar experiences. And then we'll talk about the five integrated uh, supports tomorrow. But remember, it's important to have a vision of a good life across your lifespan. 
So just a reminder, um, you can find out more information about charting the life course on frnohio.org. We are having a virtual showcase on the third and fourth. You need to sign up, it's free on frnohio.org. Um, and we're gonna have our keynote is Shelly Reynolds who under whose leadership at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, charting the life course was developed. Everything that I shared with you today is on lifecoursetools.com. Here are some additional uh, resources and websites. And I wanna stop sharing my screen and ask you to unmute and tell me, uh, if you can, two things. How do you think you're gonna use a one-page person-centered description? And I want you to be specific. I have a student who, or I wanna use it with uh, somebody on my caseload who, and what you appreciated about this very quick one hour. Again, if you want more training, all you have to do is contact me. I'm happy to um, provide that opportunity. So can I ask you to unmute and share with me? how you think you might use the one page person center description and what you appreciated about our time together today. Hi, Barbara. This is Emily. Hi, Emily. Hi. Nice to meet you. Um, nice to meet you too. I am just so encouraged by this. As a person with a disability, I wish I had access to this growing up. Um, I especially love the idea of having it in a hospital room, because you're exactly right. It was whenever my parents would step out that someone would come in. And as a child, I mean, I was able to communicate, but I was just, you know, you're sick and you're shy and you're nervous. And so to say like, can you wait two minutes before you do this blood draw until my mom comes back? Like I was not up for that, you know? So I, that's what is um, so inspiring to me. I, I just want to tell everybody about this. I feel like I'm going to give your name to so many people to have you come talk to different groups and, you know, organizations. Um, oh, I would love to. Okay, great. Um, and I, like I said, I just literally started last week, um, my first field placement seeing clients. And so I can't really say quite yet, like how I will get to put this into use, but I am 100% sure that I will. Um, and I do love that it really can be used for anyone. It's not specific for people with disabilities. So I'm, I am all about this. Thank you oh, so much. Awesome. Oh, thank you, Emily. Good luck with your placement and your studies. And you're a case, right? You're yes, I am. Yay! Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Cleveland Heights, Emily, right at the top of the hill from oh, awesome. the case campus. So Very um, good. awesome, awesome. Thank you, Emily. Yes, thank you for sharing your personal experience. Absolutely. Someone comes in and you're like, ah, <laughs> so, and you're in pain and discomfort. And, sh and like you said, shy and nervous. So right. yeah, thank you. Thank you. So join us tomorrow too, to see two more, three more tools, maybe. I'm going to try. I start my uh, placement at 1.30. So it's going to be pushing it time-wise, but I'll at least be here for some of it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Anybody else, how you think you're going to use the one page person centered description and what you appreciated today? Okay. Nobody? Scott, I see you. Oh, okay, okay, you, you must be okay. I'm um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I want to learn more about about um, what does it mean to live independently? You know, your what do you think about independence? Independence. Yeah, I've always uh, believed that. You know, but 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 I think even in this movement, uh, there is. A uh, push to be 
continue in the Tinder and what you said about pushing out all the people with disabilities, I, 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 I see that. I, I see that if you're working here, it, 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 it's still, you know, it's be, 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 be hard to use that word independent, it has to mean, you have to be self-sufficient, which as you said, is not, it's not human. He, he, was, <laughs> uh, he was not designed to do that. <laughs> I know, I, know. Yeah. I love that. It's not human. I, I'm going to steal that. Okay, yeah, yeah, because <laughs> we're not designed to do this, but we're just a that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, and, and and I don't take, I'm not taking anything away from someone's ability to live right. in their own place or, but we all need help. I mean, <laughs> anyway. Right, right. And, and also, um, the uh, local DD board has a support decision making committee. I, 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 on that committee, I will share this uh, with, yes. with them because I think that they would love to, uh, to see this, so. Oh, that's but. awesome. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, Scott is also was an independent living center, uh, one of the 12 in Ohio. Right. And he and I have been kind of chatting behind the scenes here, but you know, we would love, and Barb and I have talked about this, possibly uh, train the 12 souls here in Ohio, or at least offer it so that, because it just jives what we, what we do. Right. Um, you know, and it's a better independent living plan than maybe the two pages that we use right now. Much better. And you, and you, I think everyone's confidence increases because we get people actually engaged with us. Just because sometimes just talking to them over the phone and meeting face to face, we don't know the right questions to ask. And so we don't ask the questions that we miss a whole lot of stuff. So, right. yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you. I see it's one o'clock. And so thank you again for joining us. I hope you can also join tomorrow or for part of tomorrow. And again, if there's any groups that you know of, um, please pass my name along. Deb knows how to find me, even in the morning in my jammies. So... <laughs> That's our joke, that's our joke. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you have a chance, um, either we sent them to you already or they'll be on its way after this event um, to look at the pages with the tools because it'll make a lot of sense when you see um, what it looks like before the training tomorrow. So uh, Barb, thank you so much for doing this and we'll see everyone, we hope, and more um, at 12 tomorrow. So uh, if you need that link, Go ahead and email me or Jamie who sends the, the link to you so that you can invite people that you think would benefit from it. Take care. See you okay, tomorrow. Everybody. Have a blessed Bye -bye. day.